Hello ladies and gentlemen, we are doing a rundown of week 2, day 2. I'm quite tired today, today's, um, I feel like the lack of sleep is really adding up here. Uh, we are doing LPL, LCK, LEC, LCS, non-stop and in the time off we do a little gym session, but I can definitely feel the fatigue uh, really really seeping in at this point. Um, today, we had some matchups, some cool matchups. A KC win against Mad Lions, big rivalry there. Both teams were at 1 3, like uh, being at a 1 4 scoreline is, is tough, right? We can maybe start there by just looking at uh, the standings, some commentary on the standings. You know, we have this group of 1 4, it seems like Giant X and, of course, Rogue are just going to be reserved to be there. It's like KC really needed that win today uh, because, um, you know, uh, KC dropped that game against Rogue, which of course is a super super big deal. It seems like uh, the bottom of the standings is uh, quite defined, and uh, KC qualifying into the playoffs is very likely. Which is, you know, being two three and still having four games to go is a great relief. Uh, the boys can play with a little bit more pressure on themselves, but uh, they should of course aspire for a lot more. Uh, today was a solid game. Sakin and Targamas showed a better side of themselves, but uh, all in all, you know, this is a very neat position to be in considering how the rest of the league has played out, right? The Giant X, Rogue and Matt are sitting at 1-4 and uh, the, the, the Rogue um, win that they got against uh, Casey was still very inactive gameplay that was very rewarding due to them having a better draft for that, right? Uh, but nevertheless, Let's take a look at some of the isolated games. Um, we start off with, of course, I believe GX versus BDS. Uh, that game, uh, if we take a look at the draft, you expect, you know, GX, uh, like they are suffering from simulations to Rogue. I don't see any level of proactivity. I don't see any, like, I, I feel like the 2v2 bot is too inactive. And I think also that their mid lane is in some weird like lane states. Uh, I feel like they struggle, like Peach and Ignar, the, the, the duo is not really working together. I don't really feel like there's any essence behind how GX play. I don't feel like there's any setup. I don't feel like anything ever connects. I feel like everything is quite uh, spontaneous and random. I think that uh, they need to band-aid by picking champions that uh, streamline this process. I think that the Rumble is good for Odo Amne, but maybe they should be playing more Maokai and then, you know, find situations where they have more engage on mid. I think that's something that suits them more, like uh, Maokai, Nico, they play like Maokai Yon, Sijuani Yon. I think in that direction is good. Odo Amne Rumble looks interesting. I think they just need to have easier tools to rally around because I think when, when things require a little bit more finesse, they have a tendency to be inaccurate. Uh, BDS, it's kind of crazy how they've reach, reshaped themselves coming into this split, right? The main thing that stands out to me in the, the BDS discussion is most teams are walking into the BDS matchup looking to blind pick Rumble, looking to blind pick Jace. I think it's very important that BDS take a step back and really, really talk about how they want to approach this because in the current meta, banning things 1, 2, 3, like the Jace and the Rumble, it's not necessarily something that you always have room for. Especially when you're on red side, you need to match bans after the enemy throws bans and uh, you uh, need to be capable of playing into these champs. So it's very important BDS take a step back. You know, Adam has his champion pool, but that, that, that champion pool, you know, You'd rather have it in your back pocket rather than being uh, the main predictable aspect of yourself. Because if we look at this game, you know, you're picking Scion. I don't think this is a great Scion game. The enemy composition, you know, has uh, room to, to play. Uh, a rather strong early, but uh, GX is not uh, the most proactive team in the early game. Uh, Scion isn't a great pick here, right? It's just something that is picked here to survive. And then you're hoping that... Uh, uh, the both sides is going to carry because Sion can still be relatively useful with a with, with like low economy, right? Uh, looking at this game, you know, Lee Sin could just go top uh, whenever he wanted to collect some money and kills. Uh, it started off the chain of, of actions 
you know, here this is a moment where Ice uh, just connects with his team. He's opening through mid. This is very standard, right? It's like on base of Ice, he opens through mid and then collapses. He has Ghost. They play on this timer. Zaya's on the bot wave. In these moments, you don't want to go past the river. You want to play in this phase. And for Oriana to be in this phase so far up is, of course, not so great. This is the follow-up that I mean. Playing Sion against Rumble is quite tough because you're going to be in dive positions. Like, this is not Adam's fault. It just happens to be, you know, um, like obviously I didn't see the exact length because you don't have those details, but, you know, this is just something that naturally occurs in the matchup. But BDS was stacking Drakes and, and they were taking the better fights and uh, there was no level of uh, proactivity really from, uh, from GX that really brought them back into the game. After this fight that comes up after this, where Nico just engages on them, there was uh, not really anything going on. But I really like here the Cyan ult. Look at the Cyan ult here that lands. The enemy team is very indecisive in how they contest, and the Cyan ult together with the Rel combo uh, breaks the necks of the enemy and uh, just wins. Let's uh, listen in to the shot casting of it. From Pete, but sends it into Ignar again. A lot used, but a lot. Regent, this dragon starts off. Yeah, starts off, teleport behind for Odo. BDS, they're trying to look for an angle. You can see Adam's here. I mean, he's Giants. charging in. Oh, oh, man, it's a crash down. Oh. It's a pop up. It's a pop down. Blink and you'll miss it because the fight is over and it feels like... Uh, so what I was trying to say before, I don't think I completed my, my, my thoughts. I talked about the top lane, but it seems like BDS are practicing letting Ice play completely different champions. Uh, we see Ice playing Aphelios, Mozeri, even when Varus is open, it seems like they want to step away from that. And um, they seem to want to kind of expand the amount of champions they can or cannot play, right? Which I think is cool. I think that's super, super nice. God bless. Um, especially, you know, with how the league looks like, I think that you do have the freedom and room to actually experiment. And I think Ice is looking fine. I think he's looking fine as the carry. I think BDS is, is is struggling from other issues. I think that their top side is not as precise when they don't get, um, let's say, comfortable matchup for themselves and need to figure out the top situation with, of course, the range champions. But uh, I understand where BDS is coming from. I think that, um, you know, it puts Labrov in a different spot because I think Lavrov is very comfy when he gets to roam and has a freedom, like kind of like a barrel type role. I think that's what BDS were the strongest. I think Lavrov was the most important player actually on BDS in the previous split uh, because with the meta, Ice was kind of Ghost Jr. and Barrel was just running rampant, meaning Lavrov with the Blitzcrank and he was just roaming the map. And uh, I really like that version of Lavrov. So it seems like BDS uh, you know, thinking about, um, you know, expanding their horizons. Okay. That's BDS and GX on commentary. Uh, we continue. Let's move on to game number two, Rogue versus Vitality. So Rogue tried to get the easy out. They go for the Smolderini. Rel, Renata, Glask ban. And uh, Chase, Vitality ban, Oriana, Senna, Kalista. And after the Smolder gets locked in, they slam Vi. So, Vi is a very good champion against Smolder, right? Uh, how do you beat Smolder? I hate Smolder. Very boring champ. My complaints don't come from a place of thinking that Smolder is giga OP. It's just that it really, really sways games in a way that um, makes it quite boring to watch. You're just sitting there waiting for him to collect souls. It's very inactive gameplay and then you're like okay was this enough he farmed now for 24 minutes is this going to be enough to turn the game let's find out so you just have 24 minutes of dead time most of the time because 10 players in the game are aware of the smaller condition so I, I i just think that this champion is very boring okay so the big smolder uh here you can answer with varus tf it's like okayish right uh tf vi gets locked in Two CC champions with relatively decent range. If you want to beat Smolder, you pick long range poke or you pick very hard CC. Tom Kench, natural lock in because Vi is showing. And then Kisante gets picked for Rogue on top lane. Tali gets picked on three. 
pairing with Vi, good CC with TF as well. Perfectly solid for me. I don't mind that at all. Ari gets banned, Zinzar gets banned. Don't mind that at all. Varus Zeri gets a follow up. Also, very common champions to play. Uh, here, you know, if they wanted to, they can send TF into K Sante and they can pick something like Nautilus Kaiser or play like a bar lane if they wanted to. Maybe even go so far to play Pike. But of course, these, these things come with risk. So they just opt in to pick full scaling. This is also very cool because Gwen is one of the few champions with the W that has decent interaction into, into of course, Smolder. Good damage. Gwen, Rakan are very scaling picks and knowing that the enemy has Smolder Tomkins, you can't get away with it. So I, I, I kind of like Vitality's draft here. I think it leaves them with a lot of options. And uh, it is a clever draft to play into Smolderini. I think that uh, Rakan and Gwen for five, you just commit to full scaling because you know that your top side is already going to be in a relatively good spot. So, Nico was a new look for Larson. I haven't seen him play a lot of Nico. I think he did fine. And then uh, Viego five after the win against Casey, he wants to run back to Viego, even though Viego is not like. I think some of these Viego picks are just um, risky. I think today you can play Leeson to be stronger early and uh, have a better interaction with Gwen, but, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, enjoy Viego. I think the issue with Viego is that he's a cherry cherry on top of a cake that needs to be delicious without the cherry. I don't like the taste of cherries. Um, you have um, a circumstance where the composition needs to be complete without you. The fights need to start without you, and you need to be the follow-up that then collects at the souls of your opponents to then snowball fights because you have so many uh, abilities to really really send in the direction of the opponents nevertheless in this game i think that Vettio had quite a bit of a stinker you know in terms of his uh, individual performance i think that he can do more i think that uh, kazi has had a like like vitality is now four and one and you might ask me why is vitality four and one well, honestly, I think Douglas is having a good split. He's, he's growing. A good split by Douglas standards. I think Jongo is very competitive in Europe, so it's tough to stand out, but he's been standing out in the opposite direction and, uh, you know, in form of um, just, um, like, he, he's played pretty poor games. He's, he's kind of on that lucid arc. So lucid, slowly, you know, plays, plays his Leeson today, you know, decent performance against Genji, I would argue. Douglas with the Jacks yesterday, today with the Vi, you know, he's slowly, slowly, you know, breaking out of his shell. Because both Lucid and Douglas, they were quite different players when it came to, of course, um, the ERLs. They like to play more of the carry champs. But then you are a small fish in a big pond, you need to kind of reshape yourself and adapt to the big name players that have more knowledge and more experience than you and more potential to carry in the LEC, especially because the jungle pool is so competitive and uh, the more, let's say, low economy champions that are strong early uh, are just very good in the meta. I know some people are going to say, well, there's carry meta in the LPL. Well, Leon and Milky Way are very special players with uh, teammates that are very bought into that identity, right? So let's not uh, generalize because in LPL they really enjoy Rel, Sejuani, Vi just as much as elsewhere. Okay, so crazy to me that Comp is running no cleanse against Twisted Fate. He's really believing in this Tam Coco, uh, which is a big ask, you know. It's like if, if card forces eat, then Vi can follow up, whatever, you know. It's, it's just very greedy in my opinion. Uh, TF already has a cheetah base here. They find a good trade, and then finally Kompovic just flashes dry, like he didn't flash anything, could have maybe flashed a card, and then maybe Raka can connect as fast and he can walk away, something like this. Uh, just a dry to be two kill. Uh, like Vitality, I think uh, I started on the tangent that Vitality has been doing well. I talked about Douglas, but I think Kazi and Photon are having really, really good splits, honestly, really good splits. I think that in all of the games that they played so far, they've been very, very solid. And uh, Kazi has played Smolder, he's been playing Senna. He's uh, very aware of the souls 
I think that Kazi is playing super, super well. So shout out to Kazi, shout out to Photon as well for having a good split. In this particular game, Photon draws on his keyboard a little bit later, but I'm going to show that. So Larson ults over the wall and looks like it's going to be a good play. But keep in mind, Larson has no base, no mana here. So these last spells that he throws are it's basically, you know, the last gas in his tank. So here, Photon W, so he is not taking any damage, of course, from the last combo, which is standard Gwen play. Good job. He has Ninja Tabi and he slices through and he hits through. And uh, I don't think it mattered really what Diego did, if he picked up a soul or not. Uh, the fact that Photon gets two kills here is massive for the game. Uh, this is sort of the gank. He has, uh, he's trying to close away, but it's not enough. Fast forward. This is what I meant with Viteo. It's like he's playing a very, very long range champ that is very, very safe and he's just not tethering himself at, well at all to the opposition. Uh, this was kind of weird, a weird look for Viteo. And, uh, you know, he gets Q3'd again, he refuses to flash, and he just dies, out into breaks, and uh, he just got greedy. Like, he just had to tether himself to, to the Kessante, if the Kessante is walking on him, all is good, and all is breezy. Okay, so we continue. Um, Markun, not sure why he's standing melee against the enemy, but, you know, how squishy you are with the Kraken Slayer build is definitely something that always concerns me, especially with TFO is going to, you know, grab vision off of you. Um, yeah, but Theo's position is also super weird. Like, in my mind here, I think that he should be the one walking like that, because he spots everyone on this side, right? Even mind this is Heli Rakan spotting everyone. I don't know why, but Theo is hugging this wall. He goes, gets clipped by Comp to get slowed, and then, you know, he gets uh, CC'd and... Uh, I think he died there. Uh, we continue. Big fast forward in this highlight reel. Here Viteo's flash. Keep in mind with the with the change. So they see Larson right now. No one spots this wolf. This puppy here, honestly, and even in spectator, it looks fucking invisible. So uh, I guess it isn't too crazy that it didn't spot him. All right, so Larson gets the ult off and Viteo does a very short flash, right? He still gets connected into and uh, the fight starts horribly. Like, uh, the fact that didn't mark Larson here was quite strange, but Larson turning into a jungle minion, I guess they threw the enemy off. And a game that was very one for vitality. Um, they're giving something back here because Smolder is smoldering, but the Rogue, not known for converting their positions too well, uh, Vitality eventually close out the game. It's a very crucial moment that happens in the game where Nico has the opportunity to really, really, you know, fuck them up on bottom side. In in this particular game, what's important to note is that Photon right now is so strong that he can literally 1v2 the Nico and Kessanto on side. So he can create so much pressure to really create circumstances where Comp doesn't get to play 5v5s. We continue, Zuelis engages forward. Not the best idea in my mind here when you're playing Kisante, but I think Douglas kind of plays the situation, you know. I guess I guess Douglas, what he does kind of makes sense considering Tom Kench W's forward. Like he just queues past. I think Douglas actually plays this pretty solid. I wonder if Hilly could have snapped here. Like uh, Kuzuelis is straight up inting. I think if I think if Rakan here snaps here together with Douglas, I think that Douglas is low-key kind of smurfing here. I think I thought at first that he was inting, but he's kind of smurfing. I think Vitio like Zuelis Wing like that is very crazy. Like he forgot that he's he needs to eat people, yeah. So it's remarkably close. Comp goes for the last spell there. We have an ace. So, things are getting very weird, right? Things are getting very weird. It's like, uh, you think against Smolder, wow, you can't give it so much away. But, keep in mind, Vitality's composition scales fucking well too. Talia has no slouch, Rakan, Gwen, TF, Vi even. You know, these are champions that scale super well and have pretty decent interaction with Smolder. And while you look at the other side, it's like Tom Kench, sure gets value against Vi ult, uh, but beyond that, it doesn't scale right. Uh, is is very reliant on the scaling of Smolder, which is fine. But Nico, Viego, and also Kesante even, 
the game is 30 minutes long and the Gwen is so fed, it's like the scaling is not the same. Like, uh, Vitality definitely competes at the scaling department in such a game. <sighs> and that is all she wrote. Trying to find a situation. So here, so here we have the situation where, where, where Nash was done by Vitality. I think thoughts on here. Basically, like the, the TV gets cancelled. Like Photon just needs to commit. And all he needs to do is hourglass the Nico ult. Uh, he can W a lot of the Nico damage as well. I think that he can easily, easily get a lot more work done. Here he Ws nothing. And he also stands on the wave. As you can see, he does a massive amount of damage on the turrets. Then he ults, then he takes the turret aggro, no Zeus on guard use. He could literally end here because the enemy team cannot base. And then he hourglasses now. Oof. Hold on, really choked it here. Really, really choked it. I think even here, Photon can game a lot harder than he did. Um, but maybe he's just worried because he uh, did, in fact, uh, use his Ikas Agar the way he did. So now Tiva's knocking on Heaven's door, he's on top. He's just hitting. Nico has. No TP, so he's just gonna try to commit and uh, kill the TF. TF giving full vision in situations like this is very powerful, of course. Knowing where the enemy is flanking, not flanking, makes a huge difference. Uh, they manage to get, of course, the Drake on Viego, but they're all in such a horrible spot because they're all in the pit. That uh... Vitality is just gonna slaughter them all. That's it. GG. Oof. All right. Mad Lions versus KC. Let's take a look at the draft. Uh, Kalistaban, Senna, Varus, Jax, Vi, Smolder. Makes sense, right? No Vi, Smolder trade. Uh, playing Zeri. I think that Upset is very happy to play Kaiser, Zeri, both sides of the match. This is this is some of the best champions for Upset. So. Creating circumstances where those are the champions being played is 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 good. It's really really good, and I think the Kalista ban from MDK makes the situation easier. Relic is first picked. Kind of weird. Usually we see still even these spots. Uh, Nautilus first pick, but they are answering Zeri with Sivir. I'm not so sure what to think about that, but Arig is locked in mobile. I think that uh, you know. With, with how Sakan has been playing, he's kind of trying to find himself, you know? He's trying to find himself. Ari has been super strong. It's something that he's played in the past. And uh, he definitely outperformed the enemy mid laner today, which was very, very crucial. Very big. Uh, Ari is followed up by Nico and then CV. Viego gets picked on three. This is where I got a little bit concerned, right? Like Viego concern always. Comp is not complete. Maybe in regards to like uh, the supports that you can and cannot pick, it might get dangerous. I thought they were going to pick Alistair on 3, but uh, like uh, the Rakan of Targamas is definitely like a classic and uh, it's a uh, question. So Renata, Alistair, Rakan are all 3 pretty viable options because they synergize well with Viego, I think. And um, you know, I think that the Sivirel lane is not going to really punish you because MDK did the same thing as uh, Casey did the previous day where they picked Nico and Rel flex together, but this Rel is not going to be go flex. It's not going to be flexed. I think Rel basically cannot go jungle when Nico is mid. That's like an impossibility. Because imagine here Casey, right? If, if if they wanted to have some some kind of flex power in this draft, they pick Rel Nico. They are saying already Rel is going bot. Imagine they pick Kalista and then they pick let's say. Uh, the jungle, Lee Sin, let's say it's Lee Sin Nico. Nico can still go support and they can pivot into that direction. Or um, they can just send it mid and they have a good jungle pairing, again, good against Ari. But here, when you pick Rel Nico, Nico's going mid, Rel is going support, makes the decisions of the enemy team uh, quite a lot easier. Because here they're picking Rakan with the assumption Rel is going ball, right? So Viego, Ari, Zeri, Rakan, 
pretty straightforward. TF ban, recent ban, and then they five pick top. Very surprised here, MDK. They they blind pick the Aatrox. This invites Cabo's strongest champ, you know, Renekton. Cabo is really good Renekton. Most played from from last split, and uh, it was something that uh, he really enjoys playing. I know some people were hyped about the Poppy, but I think I think Poppy Poppy's a fine champ. But I think often people like to romanticize what you can accomplish with a Poppy W. It's not that it has one hundred percent uptime and you're going to W every fucking dash in the game. Like you, you you definitely have like pressure on these champs that rely on dashes, but they also you know have options. It's not completely black and white. I, I think that. There's definitely some champions with dashes that do better against Poppy than some others, but I think that uh, the whole Poppy W is very overblown. In this particular series, I think that um, you know the key thing was how Casey actually approached all of the fights around Drake, which is uh, oh, this is the wrong game, which of course is a very big pain point in my opinion, uh, like. Of, of what we we went through in winter and also what they've gone through in summer so that's a that's a very very positive sign mdk still was quite sharp in the early they had some good trades they pressured uh, they pressured the leoya like Elioria pressured into the jungle and they stole the wolves so i'll just show you guys the sequencing because it's because it's interesting that vision bogus pressured on the gromp you know this this blue side jungle is a very friendly space for poppy because there's walls everywhere Walls everywhere for her to trade into you, phase rush away, get cooldowns, and then do it again, and then you're in lethal range, right? Very good trade pattern for the Papushka. Uh, Vigo started blue, and Elioya went for the pressure, and realistically, like, Poppy, CV, Rel, it's very hard for them to dive. Uh, Zeri and, and Rakan, even in this game, they got some really, really good trades. Uh, Bo, uh, the Wolves gets reset, and Elioya uh, finally finishes the Gromp, and he's level 3. Here, crucial detail is that you can see Bo here goes back to check wolves, but they're gone, wasting time. Crucial detail. If his bot lane says we can't get Dove, he should just piece the fuck out and just fucking steal everything from the enemy top side and, and, and force the enemy to, to move out of bot through this because bot dive is very hard. Here, Elioya could just remove, remove himself from folk and then cross onto top side and secure his camps. Not that Poppy clears fast enough to consider this a punish against Viego. Because I don't think she's going to be able to attack Viego's response, and her own response would be so late. So Viego, after killing his own response, will be able to pressure Poppy on her response. If that makes sense. Here, Elioya is waiting a lot of time. I don't know who uh, convinced him that they can dive, but it's obviously not true. Uh, plans on Zeri. There is also Guardian. They get level three on the wave. It was already sent out. And uh, not so easy. Cabo proxies the wave. Sand stuff against Aatrox. Gets double longsword base and then walks top. And Targamos, like Aatrox also walks top. So now, Viego's taking it easy. Early lane matchup is hard for Saken. Nothing to panic about. Has a decent base here, you know, with a new Magic Mantle refillable against a Alternator and Potion. Dry Potion that is bot. We continue. Here, this was quite sad. I didn't remember what happened here because I was so surprised that actually Bo died. But, um, hmm, let's take a look at this again. Now, my main concern here is just like the mid situation. It's like enemy mid is, is, is walking first and you're stepping into river and, uh, and, and Saka needs to kind of like be fighting the Nico to prevent this from happening. And then, hmm. Could be as well that Bo could just flash downwards so he doesn't have like a wall angle. Like if he just flashes downwards here, right, then the play is just over. Like he's just waiting too long to, to for this to happen, right? Because in the end, the enemy also use sums flash for flash and uh, do you break the re-entry into both and it's completely fine. Here, this is so close for Saken because Nico, when she ults, she sees, her, she sees herself, right, unless she flashes. And then here, Fescavi also eating plants is incredibly close. Saken does the best out of a bad situation because the enemy Nico has prior, so it was a good attempt, I think. Good attempt.
Here once again, uh, Poppy uh, is spotted on the vision. Here Poppy just walks on towards. And the bow gets to farm a lot here on vehicle. He takes enemy groan, he's level 6. Poppy is still stuck on level 5 and is basing on vision, right? Put the pink there, cleared it. So they have full information and wolves uh, like bow stole everything. He of course has to ult the ult of first Kawi that he's going to press now. And that's all fine and dandy. Renetton gets to push for free and uh, trading ults like that is completely okay. Drake is alive, so no problem. Uh, this was kind of a mean play here because Saken has no flash from before. This is not something that I expected to, to work so well. The E into W, Saken can't ult out and follow up CC from Alvaro. Nice combo. Uh, Elioya had a pretty fucking decent game today. I just don't think that his champion is uh, that strong in this one. Okay, we continue. The reason I don't like Poppy is because even Poppy, even, he can, even if Poppy can stop a lot of dashes, you still need to have good pairings. Like Poppy, like if, if they had a mage mid, right, a long range mid, let's say they had Hui, I think it would have been so good with Poppy. But Poppy Nico as a pairing, it's not super exciting. Not super exciting. Even though this gank worked. This was awfully dangerous for Tagamos. Uh, I think if uh, Elioya uses W, right? I think it could have been very, very dangerous. I don't know if the interaction with Rakan, if you W right on your, the frame that you're standing, if it doesn't count as a dash. Uh, if someone knows in the comments, please let me know. It would be nice to and interesting to learn. Maybe this is something that works that way. I'm also sure myself. So, Elira Trey's ult and they managed to secure Drake, which is a big plus. I think scaling wise, red side is, uh, you know, satisfied, you know, they are definitely happy. I think the Draken scales well, and I think that's like the, the, the biggest point. Eclipse is finished for Renek. Yeah, this is the moment where I get so fucking scared. You know, this is the Mad Lion special. They cut through enemy jungle like butter, right? They cut through completely. They even see Poppy pulling the blue, right? Like they, 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 see, they see him pulling the blue, and look how lucky like Bo is. You know, this is, this is complete luck. He's completely blind. Bo is just fucking doing crap when he has three people breathing down his neck. Like, this is the Mad Lion special. Like this, of course, they're not going to play them again. But if you're preparing against Mad Lions, you need to be aware of these moments. They cross into your jungle on tempo swings and they do it fucking good. Uh, it's not the only time it's going to happen in the game. But this is like Mad Lions' biggest strength. In this particular fight, uh, you know, Alvaro does a good job of blocking the CC here from Saken, otherwise the chain CC on Sky could have been dangerous. Uh, here as well, Alvaro just surviving with so little HP uh, makes it frustrating because all you want here is, of course, the reset, and the reset doesn't land the CC chain, and then uh, Poe gets pushed close into the wall, leaving him with no escape because he has no R and no flash uh, because of the play before. Here I wonder, you know, Renekton needed to respect on the pixel because he shouldn't die to a gank. Uh, but Cabo's just joining the fray, he has big item advantage and should want to fight. Uh, Cabo, uh, in the end, uh, at least collects one and he gets uh, uh, the kill. Not so sure how important this flash was because the enemy team just didn't have spells. Okay, we continue. Uh, this was a nice move, I like this from Bo. Like, it might seem pointless, but Bow soft contesting and being ready to run and pulling them out uh, gives them information. And at the highest level, and in honestly, it, it's, not, it's just a concept of the game, so it appears, it appears always. Uh, just the fact that Zeri can push for free here, get platings for free. She has three void grubs. Like this is this is massive. She can push and uh, uh, definitely MDK are really overcommitting with this one. I can't really comment on MDK's macro here because we were stuck in a replay while it while it occurred. But uh, this is, considering the bot wave is an overcommitment, I think Zeri should hit plates 100%. She's not going to make it on time, and these grubs don't matter, and I think Kavo or this, he already pushed away. So his tempo is much better. He shouldn't be in the river, you know? Okay, 2 for 4, Casey don't need to care. They should never hard commit to, to the bot grubs. If the enemy, they should look to do them, see the reaction of the enemy. If the enemy plays bot side, all is good, you clear. Here Upset just wants to look to, to base, but Supa is just looking for another cancellation, and I don't know what the fuck he's doing here. Very greedy. He has Kraken, 
uh, item advantage and he just wants to make sure that Zeri stays in lane but this is just pushing it, this is just going too far. And this gives uh, a kill and super uses sums which of course is very important for the coming Drake. As well here, Elioia gets your CC'd and gets killed here, sucking with the with the old flash. Uh, and uh, he gets the reset. Neat. This is looking like a big win for Casey, of course. Renaton's pushing top for free. Sivir has no sums, and they're also getting a Drake, which is super important. Like leads are very polarized in a game like this because both compositions want to play the same way. Secure the Herald as well, in good fashion, very solid. We continue. Fast forwarding now to the Drake that spawns. Okay. So, uh, KC are using this setup where they have one on mid and contest through bottom side. I, I'm not a super big fan of this type of setup. I think that uh, the strongest point of, of blue side is this uh, this par part where uh, where the zombie ward is. I think that the setup you want to create is that you want to have your mid laner in river. But the reason you want your mid laner in river is because most of the time the mid lane champions that are being played are champions with a very strong abilities that function super good to poke enemies as they face check into. Ideally the setup that I would want to have, right? is that I would want to have Renekton bot, I would have Zeri on mid, and then I would want to have three players just contesting this bullshit. And when the enemy face checks, use your E, Q, W, and then of course like CC, and like just poke Poppy as he enters here, and then Zeri can always come over the wall and just defend this area. Right? I think it would have been a lot more neat. And could see Ari being isolated on mid uh, feels uncomfortable, but uh, Saken does find a way to, to play it well. Because here, MDK have a lot of reasons to just pull the trigger and push all KC players out of the space. And then all of a sudden they need to regroup on mid and they are going through the exact same process as I mentioned to you. Uh, but uh, uh, just with additional steps. Like here, MDK can just say, Ari is isolated, we should just fucking snap and engage on these fools, right? Alvaro should actively be looking on Q flashes here. They should snap all the way. They should like look to fucking combo them because these guys are very clumped up. This is looking very scary for me. What's the, the name of the game, right? It's like you, uh, you have to, you, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Uh, they regroup, they regroup, and uh, here Saken spots Frescaui, and now he has information on all. He has information, he sees four people and knows that Frescaui is isolated. Saken has mercs and takes the decision to just commit to Frescaui because Frescaui needs value from his ultimate. The spot in the 1v1, not enough value against an Ari that has mercs. So very good engagement here of Saken to find the isolated member. But in reality, Mad Lions, after pulling out the Drake, will be defending this space to make Saken isolated. Yeah? But they go all the way down and then Targama snaps. Uh, Saken and Targamas worked very well together today. Very good signs. We continue. Not here uh, when I was watching this live, I was just kind of begging, you know, Casey, just slow down the game, wait for the Drake, you're gonna be all good, all fine, no need for risk, let Ari get flash, all and all, take it easy. Uh, Bo should never be on midways. Never be on midways. Uh, I'm not sure what this play, what they're even looking for, or upset even walking up to like fucking fishing W when he has no vision. Uh, it's just insanity. All of his solo laners are just picking up camps right now, and I really, really don't like this. I really don't like this. We jump forward. Here the same thing, you know, they I didn't like this play because it doesn't seem like Kaba wants to make this play. It's like if, if you're committing to this play, I'm expecting that Renekton TP same time as your Ari and you commit all the way, you you go, 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 right? Because the fact that Kabo TP so late, even though it, it was fine that he didn't, it, it looks a little bit sketchy to me, you know, because they don't have the information, they don't know Aatrox position. They don't, they see that Sivir is together with Poppy and uh, 
they still didn't see it. I was positioned right now. They still didn't see it. And now they snap TP because the Leoya is invading. But the Leoya here is making a crucial mistake because look, Zeri wants to farm, Sivir wants to farm mid. Nico is collapsing, but Sivir is catching that wave. Maybe in the first place, you know, Sivir is over committing here to top to try to kill Saken, which give, loses them the prior. Uh, this is also, of course, a mistake because you lose uh, a lot of space and time. Saken stealing a wave and then getting out is, is super nice. Like in reality, he should just be, you know, Sivir should be on the mid wave. Here, here as well, I wanted to just point out, like, look how Mad Lions just always cut through the jungle. And Bo is, Bo is caught off guard here, losing Flash. Like, this is what Mad Lions does well. It's like you always need to make sure that you maintain information in that spot. Always have a defensive ping, always have defensive information, because Mad Lions love doing this. This is like their main bread and butter play to uh, find catches in the mid game. Ogre. Here, you know... After they killed, after the TP situation, right, and they're fighting this, you know, very good fight. Cabo TP is quite late, but it doesn't matter. It was just as late, and they managed to get these kills. Good idea, I think, to just start Nash. But the crucial detail here is just like you can turn with Renekton Flash W, right? You can hit first target. Whoever, whatever fight you get, should be a winning fight at this point. The enemy team needs to enter into the pit and you can play towards that pit. For example, here Tagamos could be playing maybe behind the cliff here, right? He can maybe take that pink out, he can play behind the cliff and uh, they can wait for them to enter. I just think that KC, they just turn too early. They turn too early, they have full information and now they go for turn. But still, the enemy hasn't entered the sphere of influence. In my mind, this, this hot dog IG icon, like, you want them to cross that line because... The odds of Poppy like fucking flashing in and smiting when you're the one hitting it is, is non-existent. I think this turn is just uh, poorly done, you know? But the idea is good. The idea is definitely good. I think that uh, Casey could have gotten Nash here. But it was in the end of the day still a net positive play. Here, Alvaro is contesting the right space, but he just doesn't give it up on time. He's so lucky that he doesn't get charmed. He's so lucky that Ari has charm on cooldown and Targamos misses W because he's going way too far. He should tether to the situation. If the enemy is spotting him, he should walk back. And uh, that's all, right? He should walk back. He should let now Mirwin play in his spot. Because if the enemy is committing like that, then Mirwin can undermine them and you go back to your team and MDK can then step into the pit more, right? And then you're just marking them and you follow, right? Kind of always, always maintain like this half circle formation sometimes if you go two full circle then the person the, the player that is midwin here just his position becomes bad because you're fighting here alvaro could have gotten gone back many times but he goes back in you know he goes back in he goes back in keeps going back in and he just kind of suicides and from the fight from before super has no flash and ghost and look how targama snaps on him the flash into wr super nice uh, spell sheet was used late, and uh, Bo gets to reset, playing severe, and uh, Upset gets to keep his summoners, and they get Nash over with two. And that's uh, GG. That's GG pretty much. That's fucking GG pretty much. Shout out to fucking Saken and Tagamas having really redeeming games on stage. I know they are capable of a lot more than uh, you know uh, than what uh, they've shown, which is super super good. Uh, I I'm happy for them. You know, I'm happy for them. The, the players uh, are capable of more. All right, let's take a look at this final fight. Just an all-out collapse here. This ward is just spotting them. I guess so, so goofy. Like, Pescava is sweeping as a minion, and he's not hitting the minion. Like, hitting the ward. So he's sweeping it, and then he, like, forgets about it. And then we just have Midwin and Frescavi just standing on this ward. Look at them. And then Kyle Casey is like, yo, should we just fucking engage them? Let's just fucking go on them. Let's murder them. And, uh, it doesn't work out super well, but it's still weird to me to just standing on the ward, right? It's like an ult. But Midwin doesn't have ult either, and he's very unhealthy. And uh, Aatrox is very ultra reliant, right? Cabo, in a very good spot, keeps the pinks. And then Bo is charging to try to find uh, the attack. But Upset's step back here is super crucial, you know? 
It's like uh, Frescao is going for the engage, makes it uh, quite telegraphed here. And the fact that Upset doesn't get CC'd uh, is, of course, the most important thing. He's still shooting, still hitting. And uh, GG. Relief. Relief for Casey, guys. Relief. <laughs> Sweet relief. 2-3 is way better than 0-5 at this point in time. I speak from experience. <laughs> good shit, good shit. Alright, Team Red vs SK. This was the the goofiest. This was the goofiest game ever. Like SK have a way of throwing impossible games. I don't know what's going on in the SK camp. It's it's borderline as if they are playing for Swiffer Camp. That's how bad it is. They are playing for Swiffer Camp. I can't provide super useful commentary on this one. I did think that this is quite a miserable Javan game to play. Um, same thing for Thresh, but I have to say Trimby and Jankos really, really, you know, did a lot of work. Although Jankos also did a monster throw of his own. So let's take a look at some of these highlights from Team Retics versus uh, SK. So. First play that, uh, you know, this this might sound weird, but I think this is just, this is quite bad. Like, Trimby gets a solo kill here. He loses HP. Keep in mind, he didn't base yet. Didn't base yet. The bottom situation is that Flacket and Thresh, Flacket and Trimby, they're doing really well. Really well. They forced DOS to base TP back on refillable. Super cool. Um, I didn't talk too much about draft, but the, the, the main thing here is my concern is that Javan doesn't get a lot of value here. Thresh needs to turbo smurf for this to work out good. And additionally, uh, SK's composition uh, kind of lacks uh, damage, meaning they can't really pressure Nash that easy. But they scale well, and I think that they should be able to get resets for Ari and Aatrox because the enemy team is rather squishy. I think that Red side draft is still better. Like if Topis was played these champs, I think they would look, uh, they would be super happy in that draft. It's just that Exa Kick doesn't strike me as a center player at all. So, the reason I don't like this from Chimbi is because he kills the guy. He wants to base TP back anyway. He gets 400 gold. God bless. Okay, cool. But there's no assist given out. And additionally, Senna and Nautilus get complete relief. Thresh could have based and walked open on both and created the free situation with this cheater base of Varus, but instead we have the situation where Exa Kick and those get to push out completely just because Trimby goes for this kill. Trimby goes for this kill, keep in mind he walked all the way here and then had to base and walk both. It's a lot of tempo spent to, of course, achieve this kill. And it's 400, it's 400 gold. But 400 gold, kind of whatever, on a matchup that is already winning. It's not going to make you more winning, right? So we continue. We continue, we continue. This was a cheeky play here. Um, Zero gets charmed and looks like fine and dandy for SK. But the turnaround here and the hook follow up with the flash. Everybody flashes in. The Avengers are here. And Exa Kick, I don't know why he just refuses to walk away. Refuses to walk away. He could walk away, walk away, walk away. Not be in Yanko's range, but instead he's in Yanko's range and he doesn't use flash. Uh, later on, Exa Kick in this fight. I didn't show how he lost flash on both, but he did lose flash. Flacket is hitting. Flacket is hitting. You know, Flacket did a pretty solid game. A pretty decent game, I would say. Let's uh, fast forward to the to the meat and bones of this uh, of this game. Now, SK was really struggling. Looked like the game was over. Trimby's hooks were landing. They were finding catches left and right. Uh, it looked like uh, the game uh, would just be a winner. Uh, Flacket was in very strong conditions, and uh, you know Wunder kept up and is playing his famous Gragas. It looked like the game was just easy peasy, just over. Monstrous. Monstrous Javan combo here. Monstrous, absolutely gorgeous. You know, he ults first and EQs everybody inside of it. He gets the ult in and he just slams them all. Niski has flash, no R, and then the EQ through everybody. 
very nice combo here from Yankos. He still has it. But now this is where things get really weird. Oh, let me show you guys this TP. What the fuck is that? What is that? What is that, guys? What the hell? That's a Ryanair TP right there, man. Fucking didn't pay, pay, pay money for luggage type flight, you know? Absolutely atrocious. Trimby with a beautiful lantern, saving his homie. And then a deep continuation. Trimby uses flash. The Wounded does a really good job in the fights to really deny irrelevant, because Aatrox always got ulted out by Gragas when he ulted, and to walk back into the fight without the move speed is, is kind of goofy. I think that Flak had also got a lot of DPS in. I think that uh, we had a little, bit, a little Gumiushi esque performance. I say that as he dies. Here, just not waiting, you know, Mercs and flashing out Maniski, just not waiting for the Nico is the problem. Uh, just Team Retics rushing when they don't need to rush. Okay, I just want to show the final moment. So, now, after this fight, Jankos turns around to look for a steal. So here, okay, you lost the fight, the enemy is going to get Drake, you're going to live to fight another day, you're still in good condition. But instead, Javan, Jankos has this? This is the... This is so greedy! You have a big shutdown. Looking for this is crazy. Because if you die, the enemy is getting national. Let's continue. Let's continue. So as you get Nash, well, let me highlight Exa Kick souls. 80 souls. Very, very low. They try to find the turn, they find it, Flacket gets flanked from behind. Not much to do there for Flacket with no summoners. Gets one shot, Niski did his absolute best to try to carry this game. Here, not sure what the idea here is. Uh, Dos gets CC'd. Not really, I'm not really sure how SK end up in situations where they are diving when the enemy is so close. I think people underestimate how tanky Gragas is when he's buying the AP because the W, the w, w damage reduction really makes you tanky because, of course, it just scales with AP, plain and simple. But still, SK looked like they're about to win a game. Viro didn't get any key targets. Extra kick here, the way he played this fight, he just gets EQ dry off of the Senna ult and then he gets ulted and then flashes in the last moment for no reason. Uh, very strange. Niski gets hooked, Trimby, on fire. And uh, Flakid has managed to stay alive, pull little Dempo's tank, and uh, just murders. Here, not sure, Niski just going melee. Yeah, but this game is just so goofy, guys. I don't have much commentary. I think. This was just a game that was completely up in the air. I think that um, both of the teams need to take a step back and think about how they draft, in my opinion, because I think that's like step one to streamlining the game process and then just making sure that they pay attention to each other's position uh, in regards to their setups for objectives. Okay. A very big one. The final one here. Fnatic versus G2. So let's start in the draft. Fnatic vs G2, Draven, Kalista, Nico, Talia, first pick after Rodin and Van, very natural, something we've seen in the previous games too. Talia first pick, fires out. Do they pick Smolder? Smolder here, um, uh, there's answers, people like to play Zeri, some people like to play Kaiser. Kaiser, Nautilus, perfectly solid. I'm super surprised they don't go Smolder and Nautilus. So I think Tom Kench is quite bad against Talia. Nautilus is pretty solid against Talia, and Nautilus is good against Smolder. What do you expect the enemy 
to lock in when you pick Nautilus, okay? Is it like Varus Renata? Is that what you're worried about? I personally think that's better than playing Smolder Tamkench against Taya specifically. So Kaiser Nautilus, this time around Noah went for the AP Pog build. So we talked about most Smolder's weaknesses before. Kaiser fits that niche very well because she has all in, can pair with an all in composition, or she can play the Pog game, right? So Kaiser Nautilus Vi works super, super well as an example. Uh, she can find good damage to follow up hard CC, uh, but also she can go for the W Pog build, uh, the LS special, and she can also have a good time. Usually the mana mune build is quite weak in lane, but uh, it doesn't really matter against Smolder. You're just gonna farm, she's gonna farm, and uh, you're going to have a champion that scales well against Smolder. So the Hamgenge gets locked in as an answer into North. I still think they should have picked North. And then Renekton gets banned, Rel gets banned, and Fnatic banned TF and Jarvan. Lee Sin gets picked on 4. Not sure why you pick Lee here. I think you just keep it simple, pick Xin Zhao. Zinza, I think, is a lot more durable. Volibear is already out. Vi is already out. I think Zinza, you lock it in. I don't see the purpose of picking Lee to create volatility in the game, especially against Fnatic. I talked about Poppy before, but the, the key difference here for Poppy, why Poppy is a lot better in this game than in the Mad Lions game, is that here, Poppy is paired with Nico. Nico wants to be able to force, needs damage, like, you know, someone to supply damage when she CCs and she wants to be the person with the oomph. Here, Talia just needs a bodyguard, you know? Talia, Poppy have some fun synergies. You can push Poppy targets through the rocks and stun them. You can push people into the Talia wall, which is a very neat interaction, and you can peel people from committing on it, right? Nevertheless, we continue. Uh, Gwendolina on five. You know, I think with the Lee Sin and the Tam, I think it's very hard to find a 5 pick that is going to save the draft, but I think Gwen is solid here. I like the Gwen when it was live. I think Gwen against Poppy, Kisant, Nautilus, you need someone to kill frontlines. Uh, and you're already committed to the scaling idea, so might as well commit even harder, because I think here picking like Nar or whatever the fuck, like all of these champs kind of suck ass. Like what can you realistically actually pick, you know, that is useful? I think Gwen is the only champ that is relatively useful. So Fnatic stomped the shit out of them. Plain and simple, they stomped the shit out of them. And they started with the bot matchup, you know? They did super, super well in the bot matchup and they had full wards on the bottom side. So let's just take a step back and take a look at uh, all of Fnatic's preparation here. They drop a ward, boom, and they drop another ward, boom, just because they want to see full lease and information and Razor starting blue. So two wards and uh, then Razor goes back to do his chickens. They listen now, crosses to do the wolves, but he went all the way. He actually went all the way. He went all the way. He did Raptors into Gromp. So instead of doing the wolves, like it's it's natural what Lee Sin is doing because he wants to spot his own blue. But the fact that he shows on vision makes Razor's decision so much easier. He does golems and uh, he gets the level three because he has blue raptor golems. He gets level three, crosses on the bottom side and sees the Lee cross the ward into top side again. They can uh, look to potentially threaten dive and just because Lee Sin is in the bottom side area, Kaiser and Autolus go for a cheetah base and Poppy crosses top side. Uh, Poppy it doesn't look for red. Gwen does a good job of like proxying and then executing, getting, uh, you know, fillable and Amtom. Stand play, good play. And then Poppy just clears the topside camps. Here, Yike recovers the game by stealing the blue. He does a little e-smite, cheeky. Uh, he, the time he spent on bot that Razok should have used as an advantage doesn't become one because of the e-smite here and Yike gets it. Here, ideally, Poppy wanted to be in a position where after blue he could base and then go into bottom side and then play for the respawn on bottom side because his bot is stronger and then, you know, leverage his items to just fight there against the Lee and he would have been happy, but with this blue steel, uh, he just stays on the map and crosses into bot and plays without items. We continue. No sums used besides exhaust. 
G2, still quite happy with this one. They secured their both side jungle, not that big of a deal. Let's take a look at when the game really, really explodes. I think Humanoid did a wonderful job of laning, really, really good job. Uh, Razor was just pathing at the bottom side. The game both is so volatile that uh, Void Grubs is not really talked about. They just want to invade the bottom camps at all costs. Oscarinin, completely slamming BB. I was in a call with Gilius uh, and of course Gilligan and of course uh, I would dominate and they were both telling me BB is not a fucking Gwen player. Even though Gwen is a fantastic uh, champion, you need to be playing it, you know? And Oscarinin solo killing Broken Blade pretty dry like that under the turret is, is really, really big for the game, of course. Uh, Fed Kisante is an unkillable Kisante, and that's frustrating for anyone. Caps, very lucky, very, very lucky. You know, they are looking for this catch on, on Caps, which isn't completely crazy. Uh, Kaiser is, of course, pushing both and showing, but here G2 cut through. This is something that we mentioned in the previous game, too, where, uh, you know, the enemy AD has free time because you are just slow pushing away on bot, right? Kaiser should be bot. And uh, you might have room for Fnatic to do a quick play, but the fact that Cap survives here is, of course, uh, tremendous for G2. And they uh, continue, and somehow Hansam, of course, gets uh, two kills here, which is a very, very big deal. The flash in the end there to finish him off, and uh, Hansam is very happy to collect his kills. But as a follow-up, luckily, you know, they get a good trade action here. They get the CC, and then Noah just uh, uh, goes and uh, finds the lethal here on Hansamo with the flash auto. Very good here, uh, because if they didn't get these kills, honestly, this game was kind of up in the air. Yak is also collapsing on bottom side, and he has nothing to, to show for it. So this was a very, very crucial all-in here that Fnatic found. It's like uh, the smolder and uh, like, like Noah pushing forward to trade heavily here is, is very nice. I like this a lot. This was a very good look here for Fnatic bot lane. Because this was super, super important. He gets a shutdown, he gets a kill, and also they get the summoners, which is going to be very important for the next thing that we show. So Talia has been pushing mid, Caps has no, no flash, and Lee Sin is very far behind. They have full control. Uh, they get the Drake, so you know the G2 can maybe stall. But as mentioned before, you know, the, 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 the scaling department isn't so one-sided due to the champions of uh, Fnatic. The scaling isn't, uh, you know... Super, super game decisive because of Kai'Sa itemization and Talia range. You know, they, they, they it's not like scaling is like complete GG on the spot. Uh, so they dive. Broken Blade dies again. There's a chase and an extension. And uh, even in that, Yike manages to die. The W playing Lee Sin here against Talia Poppy is fucking miserable, let's be honest. And uh, GG, you know, GG. Humanoid walks away the Ari ult. Beautiful. Humanoid was really in his element today, man. Fnatic seemed to be back in form, you know. Oscarina is playing his OTP, but fucking you take it, man. You take it. This is this was a very, very good look, I think. G2 has been sloppy early game, but they managed to claw the way back into a lot of games. But Fnatic was having none of that, which uh, I appreciate a lot. Uh, Broken Blade is getting zoned off the turret 1v1 against the K Koenig Rukan, which is a super big deal. And then we have the 2v2 here on mid that is kind of uh, going to uh, seal the deal. I mentioned that uh, the flash of uh, G2 bot lane matters super, super much, but I think I was just confusing the top dive with the bot dive. My mind is not working as, as good as I wanted to at this point in time. Okay. Ari jumps also in back and then here you can see the interaction of dragging uh, the Ari through the rocks doing a lot of damage and we're gonna see a Marek Brazdalini smile just soon it's a, it's a very pretty one look at this where's the Marek Brazda smile look at that one what a handsome man Marek Brazdalini beautiful all right so uh, Noah has Q upgrade uh, he's uh, putting five points into Q. 
uh, he doesn't have uh, the elixir of skill. He maxes W second. That's a part of the tech that Ellis and Unforgiven talked about. Right? Elixir of skill having level 10 and max W is a part of the idea with four points in Q. Uh, but uh, not a big of a deal. You know, it's fine. It is what it is. He's going for Ludens now. Gets 80 from it. And then here, very nice poppy old man. Fucking beautiful. Razulk, poppy. Best in the league. For sure. Elio had a pretty fucking decent game. It just wasn't a good poppy game, I would say. Okay. So, after that dive, Humanoid hits the fattest W you've ever seen. This is fucking Mount Everest, this fucking cliff that he raises, because they were sent flying, bro. This was fucking crazy, man. Crazy. And this just fucking seals the deal of the game, right? They just get too much gold in this swing, and it is just a fucking fanatic show from, from that point onward. You know, they try to do some cheeky smolder stacking fucking gameplay, but uh, I don't even look at that. You're here at the end because probably you want predictions. My predictions are not going to be anything too crazy, I think. You know, BDS versus Team Heretics, you know, I think... That's a game that can be kind of a toss-up, I think. Trying to think of what we've seen so far. I low-key feel like Team Heretics have shown a little bit of better League of Legends. So I'm going to go Team Heretics with this one. Uh, Vitality versus Fnatic. Vitality is 4-1, but I think Fnatic's form is just more credible. You know, and I think Fnatic have strong enough players to hold back Kazi and Photon. But uh, this is definitely like an exciting match too. Uh, G2 vs GX, uh, Rogue vs MDK, um, both 1-4, but I do think MDK is better because they are just more proactive. Uh, but um, MDK tend to be sloppy. And uh, Rogue, if they have like a scaling draft, uh, you know, then maybe, just maybe, they can make it through. I think Finn is looking decent. Um, I think that Larson had a fine Nico game today. Uh, but... Um, the way their support is playing together with Jungle uh, is just not good enough. And then SK versus KC. SK, is the, SK has been playing terrible, honestly. I think that the, the key entry point here for KC is just that uh, figure out how you want to approach both here. I think that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if post bans SK end up on first pick fucking Zeri. Because I think both teams want to play fucking Zeri, but I honestly, I want to predict KC at this point. I think KC, after today specifically, where Targamas and Saken showed up more, I think that they are good to go. I think also Kabo getting last pick, maybe you can set up for another Renekton angle, maybe a tank top angle. I think that this with Kabo is very effective. And um, the main thing for me is like, I'm concerned that they were, are going to get too hyped about this Viego, because I think Viego but pretty carried on the day. I think um, this was the the vehicle is dangerous for me, man. Not a fan. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. If you made it to the end, bless you and bless your face. I'll catch you 